warm welcome to everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you, this is Aya Ananda Bodhi, and I'm speaking to you from the, the library of Aloka Bahara Forest Monastery in Placerville, California, which is uh, currently far from fires, but still smoky. I'm guessing it might be smoky in some of your places too. Uh, so I hope you have clean enough air to breathe right now as we practice together. And I'd like to begin with um, the refuges and precepts for those who would like to take them. Um, you know, the refuges is so important at this time, at any time, but I think, you know, there is so much dissolution happening of uh, what, we, what we have known to be normal is not normal anymore and uh, just as Noam was saying a minute ago we, we can't um, you know we can't just sort of assume that we know what's going to happen in three months or you know we can't really plan ahead in the way that we used to believe that we could so uh, the Buddha is offering a refuge the Buddha was so clear that the that nothing is stable, nothing is certain, nothing is lasting. And uh, he pointed to taking refuge not in, not in things and not in uh, positions or personality, but in truth and awakeness. So when we take uh, refuge in the Triple Gem, we're taking refuge in the Buddha, who was the awakened one who gave such a, an amazing teaching that we can still practice and benefit from now, 2,600 years later, which is so awesome. It blows my mind every time I think of it. And, um, and, in, the, and in the quality of awakeness, which is, uh, which is the potential of each of our hearts and minds. And uh, taking refuge in the Dharma, the truth of the way things are, the, the nature of things and taking refuge in Sangha, in community, in spiritual companions, and in knowing that there have been and are those uh, people in the world who have gained levels of insight and realization. So it's, uh, Sangha is, is, um, is both the, the noble ones who, uh, you know, who have deep penetrative insight, and also our, you know, each other, our community and you can also see it internally that that within you which is willing to do the work that's necessary for this practice of awakening so we begin by uh, taking refuge uh, three times and then the five precepts are a support for our practice there is sort of a basic support to stop us sinking and when we're not keeping those precepts, we might have a good meditation and then we sink, or we might you know, have a find a good friend and then pff, things sink because we're um, we're leaking we're like a leaky boat when we're not living within those precepts. And uh, some people do that, you know, live in a leaky boat and bail it out a lot, do a lot of bailing, or get others to do the bailing. Um, Buddha recommended just fix the boat, it will get a much better journey. So these, uh, this is what we'll be uh, offering now. So Inam, if you could get that uh, page up for us, that'd be great. Okay. And at the very beginning, we pay homage to the Buddha three times. So I'm gonna chant, and you please um, chant along with me. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambutasa Bhutang Saranang Gachami 
Dhammang saranang gachami Sankang saranang gachami Dutiyampi bhutang saranang gachami Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami Dutiyampi sankang saranang gachami Tatiyampi Bhutang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sankang Saranang Gachami Good scroll, thank you. the five precepts. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. So these precepts are a support for the happiness that we always seek, They're the support for lasting wealth, wealth of the heart, their support for the peacefulness that leads to liberation. So take good care of this practice of precepts. Let's sit together. <clears throat> Find a posture that supports um, alertness and uprightness and also a sense of ease, relaxation and ease. Find this place of balance between uh, effort and letting go. And become aware of your feet, maybe on the ground if you're sitting on a chair, or maybe in your lap or under your lap if you're sitting cross-legged. Be aware of your feet in contact with the ground. And not staying up in your head and thinking about the feet, but moving your attention all the way down to your feet, to the feet themselves. Just knowing how they feel. They might not feel like feet, they might give you a different sensation, but you just know what does the feet feel like right now. Moving your attention up your legs. Almost like uh, the, if they were filling with a liquid or something like that. But the liquid is your attention. Letting your legs fill with your attention. Coming up to the knees. Just knowing how they feel right now. The thighs.
coming up into the pelvic area, just knowing how that feels. into the torso, the lower torso. Belly and the <clears throat> lower back. Your upper torso. Just noticing if the spine is aligned. Are you leaning forward or is there a straining going on? So you can just move a little bit to find that place of balance. And coming to your hands. So what do your hands feel like right now? Maybe some warmth, cold, coolness, contact, or touching maybe each other or touching your lap or the arms of your chair. Just noticing the contact. Coming up into your arms, your forearms. your elbows. Your upper arms. Just letting them fill with your attention. Noticing if you pay more attention to one side than the other. Just balancing that out. Coming up into the shoulders. your neck, jaw, the whole of your head. Now starting at the crown of your head, letting your attention sweep down systematically through the body. Just noticing what you find there, not stopping too long to stay with this or to get away from that. Just systematically sweeping through the body, knowing it as it is. knowing when there's 
sense of contact, warm texture, or maybe numbness, or tingling. Just knowing your pain, there might be pain or pleasure. Just knowing it as we sweep through from the crown of the head down through the body. All the way down to the soles of your feet. You'll broaden your attention to taking the whole of your body sitting here. And just noticing if the mind wants to scatter, get distracted. If it does, just bring it back to one place, and I would suggest the belly. Being aware how the belly rises and falls with each breath. If we're not uh, shut down, if we're very shut down and not breathing shallow breaths, we may not move the belly. And if you find that's what's happening for you, I would suggest take some deep in breaths and all the way down. Of course, you're not literally breathing in the belly. The lungs don't go that far, but getting the whole body involved with the breath. Taking a couple of really deep breaths and then letting go. Let your attention settle into the rising and falling of the belly with each breath. So now we're letting go of controlling the breath and trying to make something happen. Just being with that natural rhythm, expansion and contraction of the belly with each in-breath and each out-breath. Just noticing if there's any overlay, any stories, shoulds and shouldn'ts, liking and disliking. Just for now, I can say to those stories, this isn't the time for you. This is the time to simply be aware of the rising and falling of the belly. Of 
we always feed our stories with our attention, they are nourished and they get strong. So for this time of meditation, our attention is saved for the rising and falling of the belly, for the process of breathing. This happening right now in this unique way in your body. Let there be an intention of peacefulness and letting go as you breathe in and breathe out.
Just wait a moment for everyone to come back. So I'd like to begin by paying homage to the Buddha. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasam So it is a remarkable thing that uh, 2,600 years ago, a guy went on a search for freedom. Someone with great focus and uh, purpose and didn't stop until he found it. And then thankfully, for our, you know, with our good fortune, he passed on this uh, very complete teaching. Um, like a whole map of the journey, really. Uh, without clear image of where we arrive. Because uh, there is no image, really. And perhaps there is no arriving, in a way, or no one to arrive getting a little zen now. Um, but uh, thanks to this incredible dedication and practice of the Buddha, you know, he, not only the practice that, that led to his liberation, but the ongoing 40 years of teaching and sharing the Dharma, walking from place to place in, you know, hot, dusty, sometimes cold India, northern India. And uh, you know, getting to know, you know, discovering different ways to present this teaching, uh, this, or to point to this truth. And it's a subtle truth that he's pointing to. The ultimate truth that he's pointing to is very subtle and also very obvious. It's, it's a, one of those mysterious things. It's, it's a, an open secret. What, he's, what he discovered and what he found is, is here all the time, accessible in, in every moment. Something that we can understand for ourselves, that we can know directly for ourselves. And yet, you know, it can be so hard to see, it's so hard to remember. Uh, we can be looking in the wrong way and miss it altogether. So, the, the teaching has this, this quality where it's almost like a hologram. 
you can you can start from one perspective and come in and then the whole teaching opens up or you can approach from quite a difference you can approach say through the the five aggregates that make up the sense of this of me and mine and the whole teaching opens up from there or you can approach from the six senses i.e and nose tongue body and mind and then the once you start getting into that, the whole teaching opens up from there. Or the 12 steps of dependent origination is kind of a subtle, complex and beautiful teaching. You go in and the whole teaching opens up from there. And then there's the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, and the whole teaching opens up from there. And it's like all of these different ways in and they take you if we, if we use them, if we practice them, they take us to at least have glimpses of that truth that the Buddha was pointing to. And then there's a, there's a very simple teaching or you know, it's, it's very simple kind of matrix that, that comes up again and again in the teaching, which I feel like I wanna speak about today. And that's the three characteristics of existence. Um, so the Buddha pointed to not just us, not just we are part of, made of these are that these three characteristics um, are pertinent to us, but to everything, everything in the universe. And so he's pointing to everything being of the nature to change. Everything is in a state of flux. Everything is changing all the time. And because everything is changing, there's a sense of unsatisfactoriness to it. It's not ultimately satisfying. Whatever, whatever we reach out to, whatever we, we try and hold on to or try to become is not ultimately satisfying. And the third characteristic is that it, uh, you know, being changeable, un impermanent and unsatisfactory, we can't call any of this experience me and mine in a really true way. So simple little, in some ways, simple little nutshell teaching. And yet it's, it's also a vast teaching and uh, a practice that's sort of in a way we have to kind of go through layers, layer upon layer until we start to see more clearly. Oh, I get it. Oh, I see. It sort of has that quality to it. And, and every now and again, we might get a big aha moment where we see really clearly. And that changes everything. So once we start on this path uh, of awakening, once we start on the Buddha's path and, and start um, practicing and exploring and and experiencing the fruits of the practice and uh, gradually understanding more clearly. You might go in that way. That was my way in, first of all, sort of with faith, you know, embarking on the practice and meditating and reading and trying to understand. And then through that practice, starting to experience the, the truth in, in little glimmers and sometimes in bigger bigger um, vistas and then it's like oh oh and the, and the more we see the more we have to keep going on this journey you can't you can't kind of stop once you started <laughs> and I certainly uh, early on wished I could at times it's like oh no get me out of here and then but when I just because one has to start facing the, the difficult stuff one has to start facing all of the delusions, all of the greed, the confusion, the aversion that, that has been layered and layered upon this uh, the true nature, which is free. So it can be, uh, there can be times when one might wish that one never started. But the, uh, the thing with this, the Buddha's teaching is it kind of covers everything. So I remember looking at one time of like, oh, you know, I was already in the monastery. I was quite young, starting quite young. And then I was like, oh, 
this is really hard. This is really challenging. I think uh, maybe I changed my mind. <laughs> and then kind of trying to find a way out to where I could just get away from the whole thing. And it's like, no, there isn't any way out. It's, it's all encompassing. This, this teaching points to everything. It even points to this very experience of trying to find another way out and not what it, you know, it's like the Buddha's got it covered. He's got the whole thing covered, thankfully. So, you know, we may go through those times where it's where we wish that we didn't have to keep doing this practice, where we didn't have to keep seeing so clearly, where we didn't have to keep meeting the, the, um, the limitations of our own mind that is part of the practice to understand those. And we didn't have to really, really take in the impermanence and the unsatisfactoriness of this life and this world and this universe. There are times when we wish, I should speak for myself, there have been times when I've wished I hadn't, didn't have to, didn't have to uh, see that. And then the path just says, keep going, keep going. There is no turning away. You cannot turn away and you can try. It takes a lot of effort once you've started to look, you know, you have to, uh, anyway, not recommended. So, so these truths, everything is in a state of flux. It sounds kind of like, oh yeah, yeah. I know everything's changing. I can witness impermanence, it's, yeah, no big deal. And then we start to take it a little bit more, let's say, uh, personally first. It's important to know. So what does that mean in my life? What does it mean to live with the reality that things are changing all the time? That, you know, what I, what I hold on to is, you know, it's maybe, here for now, but it's going to change. People I love, they're going to die one day. And this body here is going to finish its job one day. This job is still working right now. It's doing what it's meant to be doing. It's working pretty well on this one at the moment. And, and at some point it will be done with the work of being uh, Ananda Bodying, in my case, you have your own names that your body is part of. It will be done with that work and it will go back to the earth, which is perfect. What is, so there's a perfection in that. So what does it mean to really take that in? Not just as a concept, everything's impermanent, but to, to, to touch it, to know it, to feel it, to experience it. So as long as we're trying to hold on to what is changing, it's going to hurt. We're going to be disappointed. It's going to be hard. And the more we're aligned with the natural flow, natural process of things, the more freedom there is. And that's not to say that everything will go our way and uh, no troubles will arise and we won't get have to face difficult experiences. The Buddha never promises that, actually. He never says that you know, once you're enlightened, that then you know, the world suddenly becomes very sweet and you know, flowers throw their petals at your feet and everyone speaks sweet words to you forever. He never promises that. But uh, he does promise that we'll be at peace with the way things are. There'll be freedom, freedom from wanting and not wanting, freedom from fear, freedom from confusion. So there'll be clarity, presence, responsiveness, aliveness. 
and uh, as a natural part of uh, the process of awakening as we as we um, let go of the of the greed and the hatred and the confusion and natural evolution is for the beautiful qualities to shine forth more clearly compassion generosity kindness wisdom faith these things start to shine it's like they're always here they I, I don't know if this is um, doctrinally true but latent I like to think of them as latent and uh, when we get all of the rubbish out there they can shine they can have strength and and we um, we manifest in the world through those beautiful qualities instead of through our fears and confusions and griefs and doubts and um, resentments jealousies whatever may be going on those small things those things that keep us small So everything is in a state of flux, everything, this whole universe. It's kind of wonderful, actually. There's, a, there's an awesomeness to it when you really align your mind to that. Everything is in a state of flux. Even the, you know, this, this planet Earth itself, it's, it's in a constant state of flux. It's constantly changing. and everything in it, including ourselves, fluxing, 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 changing, changing, changing. And when we know that, the more clearly we know that about ourselves, well, let's start with other, you know, the more clearly we know that with, with the world, the more we can let go. We don't try to make the world something it can't be. And also the more compassion arises. So we're motivated, we're responding more from a place of both compassion and letting go. It's like love and letting go. Both of those things, they kind of come together in our response to the world instead of getting angry or afraid or hiding a head under the covers or, or just trying to get the nice bits out of life. There's uh, those qualities of compassion and wisdom arise. So every, and then with ourselves, the more we understand that what we call me and mine is also a process, conditioned process. It arises, it's arisen in this way with certain causes and conditions of the past and it's going through this process and we don't know how long for you know we don't know even if we're going to live till the end of this call together really although we assume we will but who knows actually so we're in this process of life and we have no idea really how long it's going to go on for but we know that it's happening right now. So we bring our attention to this, this. And I'd just like to invite you to turn towards your own experience right now. Bodily experience. And maybe you're, you know, part of that is breath heat and solidity, there might be some physical comfort or discomfort. There might be judgments. About this body. There might be old scars. Just embrace the whole of this body that's 
It's perfect. It's perfect as it is. Changing all the time. Just taking it in. Recognizing that it's you know, ultimately it's made up of the of the earth, water, fire, air, space. And it will return to that. So it's, uh, it's the vehicle that we're riding in for this lifetime. Some of us may have, have a beautiful Jaguar, some of us an old, maybe beat up old Volvo, maybe a rickshaw, or even a bicycle. But it's, it's the vehicle that we have for this lifetime. It's a good one. It's the vehicle that is given to us for the purpose of liberation. Not just for the purpose of having a nice experience. But much more, the potential is much greater than that. So seeing what the body is made up of, seeing how feelings change all the time, seeing how perceptions are influenced by conditioning, thoughts changing all the time. Sometimes we can uh, guide our thoughts in a good direction, sometimes they're just all kinds of crazy stuff going on in there that we don't really want to hear, but it's just going on anyway. So are those thoughts me and mine? And then the senses, uh, sense experience, which is also very interesting to start exploring. It's just we only got a little short time here, but you know, pick one of your senses one day, seeing the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue the body, the mind might be a little bit advanced to start with, but you can get there one day, later on maybe. But just pick one of the senses and, and explore your relationship to, to visual contact, for example, seeing. Just, uh, you know, these senses are, are impacted all the time by a constant changing flow of experience. And we call them me and mine. So the Buddha's saying, you know, this is, this is uh, let's say a, a case of mistaken identity. These are phenomena, they just are what they are. And so explore the places where we hold on, where we want and where we don't want, or where we're confused, where we get, we get pulled in and mesmerized. Exploring how that arises in your own life through one of the sense doors. I'd start with just one. And uh, so I, thought, I often, I kind of like the not self teaching. I, often, I just kind of jump there without realizing I'm there sometimes. So in the middle between impermanence and not self is the dukkha aspect. <laughs> so the dukkha, the dukkha aspect is, I mean, actually, you know, when we, uh, it's not so hard to see. I think it's the one that gets most of us into this practice in the first place, recognizing the dukkha, that what we're, what we're trying to find you know, peace and satisfaction in isn't satisfying. We might get a little gratification for a while, might be, might feel good for a while, but it's, but then it's fleeting. So each of these three characteristics, they're all different aspects of the same reality. You know, just looking at it from different perspectives. And they're very, very important. They're very, very key practices to explore. So when one 
uh, gains real like strong insight into the Dhamma, like when the Dhamma eye awakens. It's always through understanding one of these three characteristics. Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, or not self, or corelessness, it's sometimes called, no core, I put my R in there, corelessness. So, uh, and it might be, you might find that your mind picks up on one of those more than others, so that maybe you have a, a tendency to see the, the dukkha. So then, you know, the, the, the danger is to see the dukkha and then become somebody who is experiencing dukkha rather than get curious about it. Where's that coming from? What's that about? And, and of course, you know, there are all of those external things that we can point to that are causing it. But the Buddha also had all kinds of external things that were challenging, but he wasn't experiencing the dukkha. So how do we find that place of freedom that is aligned with the way things are? So I think I'm gonna just leave that with you for this uh, day, week, month. And um, I did want to have time for question answers. We only have a very short time. I do tend to go on a little bit. So, um, but if anyone does have a, a question or a, or a um, comment, I'd be very happy to receive that. Sheila. Good afternoon, Ananda Bodhi. It's so good to see you and hello everyone. I had a quick question. I was curious about in your personal practice, the story that you shared, what was it in that moment where you said, realized, and let let go all of those thoughts of maybe I'm, you know, am I supposed to be here or I want to take off? Uh, do you mean um, what what was the turnaround back to the path? Mm -hmm. Well, you know. To be honest, you know, because I've been interested in Buddhism for a long time before I started meditating, because I didn't have anyone to teach me meditation. And then quite quickly after starting to meditate, I ended up in the monastery, like within a few years. So I was sort of by then kind of immersed in the teachings, you know, pretty much. And um, and then I was like, oh my goodness, you know, this is all a bit too much. And I think I changed my mind and, you know, and I found there would be, th it was pretty much the whole of the teaching. It was a sense of it, it's just like laid out like a brilliant map. It's like, he's, he's just laid out the whole map of the journey. So I'd be like, well, maybe it's not really true. And then I'd look, oh, five hindrances. One of the five hindrances is doubt. So it's just a hindrance. Okay. And then, you know, Oh, I, I could just go and you know go back to my life before, and I was having such a great time, and I had my lovely partner, and and then and then it's like, well, the path is leading in the direction of letting go, not accumulating, the renunciation. I'm like, oh, yeah. it, it's just like wherever I looked, it was, it was just pointing me back to, you know, the Buddha's like, I got it covered, every time. <laughs> So it was more like the mind looking for a way to, to, to um, not see, not see what it had seen, the, the truth that it had seen. And it's like, you know, no, it's, it's, there's no going back. And actually, as I was saying that in the beginning, I noticed, I don't know if that's right, but I had a sense that you were kind of like, mm -hmm, you know, with that sense, like once you start, you can't really, that's it, you know, it gets to a certain point where you can't, it's not your choice anymore, really. I had a sense that you were sort of resonating with that when I, when I said it. And I did. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> May it take you all the way, all the way.
Yeah, it's it's um it's not an easy journey, and yet the alternative is desperate. So uh, you know, fortunately, there are times when it's like wonderful. I think it is. It does seem like a journey for me. I see it like a journey. You know, there's like you set off and you got your gear and you think you know what you're doing and and then you know and then and you've got the map and you know it's just like oh yeah okay you go there and go there and there's the mountain and, and then actually when you're doing the journey it's, it's hard work yeah. and, the, and you get blisters and your feet hurt and you, you know you fall in the mud and and you're not as fit as you thought you were getting up that mountain and all of that and you get a little sidetracked and lose the path for a while and find it again and all of that can happen it's, it kind of is like a journey and then as we're doing it we're getting stronger and fitter and more capable and, and more confident and it's it's uh, it's doing its job and then from time to time you know you get to the top of the mountain and you're like wow wow you know i never even imagined there could be such a vista you know and then and then you have to keep going and then it's like sometimes you get down into the to the dark forest or into the swamps and you know it's like and then you get out of that again it, and it sort of is like that and it's so worth it and as long as one's you know with as long as one's present you know as long as one's present with what's happening it's all good but i do i do feel that sangha you know like being together having connection is, is vital essential for the path so even just sitting even though you know sitting with you all here it's like it nourishes something in my heart it's like yes this is we're, we're doing this together it's, it's very very important okay. just like to end as home well, it's at three o'clock now so it's like to end with a little uh, blessing chant and I'm going to chant in Pali, and it's, uh, but the blessing is basically wishing that all of the forces of goodness and protection support you and uh, keep you well on the journey. Bhavan to te, bhavan to samba mangalang rakan to samba devata samba bunda nu bhave nasada soti bhava to te, bhava to samba mangalang rakan to samba devata samba dhamma nu bhave nasada soti Bhava to te, bhava to samba mangalang, rakang to samba devata, samba sankhanu, bhavena sada soti, bhava to te. So nice to be with you all. Do take good care of your practice, your heart. I hope we meet again. <laughs>